on behalf of TNG, I welcome every one of you. Uh, we're very happy to have you. Um, the, it shows again that uh, TNG um, has a lot of friends. So we came to appreciate the Big Tech Day, but also our friends came to appreciate the Big Tech Day. Um, I believe that we're going to have a lot of fun together. And uh, even though it's not the usual format, um, it's still very interesting what we're uh, seeing today. And yeah, so um, let's get to uh, our speaker. Uh, I think most of you already know him because he is quite well known. Uh, you should see him now. It's Matthias Boos from Copenhagen, Denmark. He calls himself a distributed systems expert, but I think he is uh, an expert in many more things. <laughs> so uh, we were lucky enough to have him as a speaker in the Munich Node user group in the past as well, where he told us about, um, for instance, how you properly close Node.js uh, streams, um, which is something that sounds trivial, but certainly isn't, considering there are different um, implementations and different versions of Node. So uh, he has proven that he is an expert at the technical details and um, He's also a person with a vision, obviously, because uh, in today's talk, he's going to tell us about problems that big enterprises these days also um, face. And he is a co-founder of HyperDivision, and he's going to talk about uh, the work that he's doing there, uh, especially um, secure file sharing. Um, and they're using a peer-to-peer -peer technology, and he's going to present this. So I'm very excited about it already. Um, and uh, just to... Uh, stress this fact once more. Uh, Matthias is also a very, very uh, active driver of the open source community. Um, it, well, if you look at his uh, GitHub profile and you will see that he is a maintainer of 824 as of this morning packages, which is an incredibly high number. So if all of the, let's, let's um, do the math together. We have 100 participants in this call. If each one of you maintained eight packages, then we would be on par. And I don't believe that we do. <laughs> so <laughs> it's very impressive. Um, and yeah, so uh, that's also a reason why we should thank him because he's supporting our everyday's work, right? So um, we're very happy to have him as a speaker and we're very interested in what he's going to tell us. And since the talk is not going to take up our full time box of 55 minutes, um, we're going to have the time for questions. And he also agreed that we can interrupt him for questions. So. Uh, please use the Q&A feature. It is the main source where I will be looking for questions. And before you post a question, maybe look at the other ones and vote them up. So uh, it's gonna be easier for me to prioritize. Um, furthermore, we have a couple of panelists also in the stream uh, that may also ask questions. I would like to ask you to raise your hand so we get a visual uh, signal from you. Um, the others, yeah, there is the raise hand feature um, for attendees as well, but uh, please don't take it personally if I don't pick you. Um, let's see how many questions there are. And uh, yeah, let's just try to have fun. And now I think we're ready to go. And we are all very interested in what you're going to tell us about Hyperdrive. Thank you. That was a, uh, that's probably the best introduction I ever got, to be honest. So I appreciate that. It's, uh, it's very thorough. You know, it's when you've been in this space for as long as I have, I think I've been in uh, Nodes for eight years now, or maybe six years. Maybe that's longer than Node existed. I don't know. But it's like basically since their start, uh, you've been around for a while and you've seen a lot of things and you've seen a lot of shifts. And, you know, you know back then, we, uh, when we were just... Uh, hacking on things. Um, if somebody had told me like, you know, that today big enterprises would be using Node and all this kind of stuff, uh, we would have been like, yeah, that's no, no way. So it's it's kind of fun to reflect on that journey. But yeah, thank you so much. Uh, I'm so happy to be here. I, just, it, it, I haven't done many um, virtual conferences. Uh, obviously, I've done way more in the <laughs> recent uh, months than in the past. Uh, it's, it's uh, but I've actually been enjoying it quite a bit. You can, you know, it's nice. You can be on Reddit while you present, so nobody will know what's going on. It's pretty, uh, pretty neat. Uh, but yeah, so um, I'm going to tell you today uh, uh, a little story about uh, some peer-to-peer -peer stuff. If you've seen me before, I've spoken at TNG before. I <clears throat> I tend to talk about peer-to-peer -peer things because uh, you know I do a lot of things, but at the end of the day that's 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 what's close to my heart and like that's that's what i want to drive and that is what i'm driving so so um, um 
yeah, I'm just really happy to get the chance to to tell you about it. It's also it's a big day for me to talk to talk about this today because actually you know we're we've been ramping up towards a massive release uh, that's happening next week. So this actually turned into like a nice uh, little presentation preview of that. Um, so I was very happy to be given the chance. The timing couldn't have been better. So so yeah. So what I further do, I'll I'll just get into it. The talk might take anywhere from. 20 minutes to four hours. So we'll stop obviously before <laughs> one hour because we have a deadline. I'm just saying there's a lot of ground to cover. And uh, I tend to do these talks where uh, I like to cover a lot of technical stuff too because that's my expertise. Uh, and uh, but you know, hang in there, hold on to your brain. Uh, we'll get to you know demos and fun and all this kind of stuff. And and, and let's mention you know interrupt. Uh, we can talk about anything. But yeah, so. Let's get to it. So I'm, uh, if you don't know, I'm Muffintosh. Uh, I don't need to introduce myself anymore. Um, that's my online handle. Uh, it has a long story. Uh, basically it comes from my old Diablo days where I played Diablo and then it just left over. So it's one of those teenage legacies. It's pretty fun. Uh, that's how I'm known online. That's how you reach out to me. If you have questions after this, um, uh, you know, I'll be tweeting the material and stuff like that uh, on Twitter and GitHub, whatever, feel free. Uh, and that's how I changed the slide. Awesome. <clears throat> so I'm going to talk today about a peer to peer file system um, called Hyperdrive. Um, Hyperdrive is uh, it's like a self hosted component uh, and it's part of this bigger ecosystem uh, called that, where a lot of different people are building a lot of very interesting things on top of uh, these peer to peer building blocks uh, spanning anywhere from file systems to people doing um, mapping of the Amazon uh, for indigenous people to avoid uh, all, all companies taking over the Amazon to people be building decentralized chat uh, to people doing art installations in uh, Russia to you know, companies distributing tons of data, all kinds of things, massively expand uh, ecosystem and it's really fun. Uh, I work on the main, you know, each peer-to-peer -peer drivers of that uh, and Hyperdrive is one of them and that's what I'm gonna be talking about today. <coughs> so like I said, uh, I like to call uh, Hyperdrive a peer-to-peer -peer hypermedia file system. Um, so hypermedia is like, it's this broad term of, you know, basically anything you can share in a browser normally is, is hypermedia or like basically any content, you know, it's, it's linkable content. Um, so it's anywhere from, you know, big videos to HTML files to JSON data to, you know, any, any, any kind of data that's like, you know, linkable. Um, and this is a file system that just caters for that uh, in a peer to peer fashion, uh, meaning, you know, no central servers, uh, everything is, everything is, is uh, distributed and, um, um, spread out and then, you know, people can help share the load and stuff like that. So, um, <clears throat> uh, and it's all open source. Uh, uh, so, you know, and free to use, so you can clone it and, 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 and use it and, and, and also just consume it. Uh, I like to talk, you know, I always kind of, yeah, I worked a lot in BitTorrent before. Uh, I have, have a long history in working with BitTorrent uh, as a file sharing protocol. You, probably everybody has heard about BitTorrent at some point. It obviously got a very bad reputation for just being a piracy uh, vector because that's kind of how we use these technologies in the, in the early 2000s and 90s. Luckily like, now we are at a, at a stage where it's, it's more about just moving data around uh, and, you know, interesting use cases. Um, so we, I, I like to, you know, when I first started out doing this stuff, I would always say this is kind of like, what we're trying to do is kind of like BitTorrent 2.0. Um, and there's a lot of protocols in that space. Um, but actually, you know, today we're, you know, we're so past that vision that what we're doing today is basically BitTorrent 3.0 uh, because we're, you know, we're not just like BitTorrent with more stuff. And, you know, even with this current release, I would say we, we're past that. We're so past that now. We're just like a completely new thing, but, you know, it, it helps to frame the conversation if you think of this like as a, you know, the idea of BitTorrent, but like taking to, to a much more interesting place, in my opinion. Uh, I can say that because I work on it. So I think that's okay. Um, so basically what we're trying to do is like, if you ever use something like BitTorrent um, or a lot of all the, almost all the other technologies in this space, it's all focused on uh, what we like to call static sharing. So static sharing means that, um, um, that you take a snapshot of your data and you put it online, but that snapshot can change 
So it's kind of like, it's been really good for just being like, here's some content, get it out there. <clears throat> and then you can spread it out nicely. Um, that um, model was really good in BitTorrent and stuff like that, and it's very simple, but it's, it's not really good for like live file systems because we, we, we know when we work with data, we work with real time. Um, <clears throat> so what we try to do in hypervisor is kind of take an angle where it's like, it's real time first. So what that means is that every time you do a change in this file system, like a change here means adding a file, editing a file, <clears throat> or changing the permissions of a file, you know, any kind of change, that changes immediately version, similarly to what you do in stuff like Git or version control, uh, but like with no interaction from the user, it's just implicitly versioned. And that change is spread out through the network instantly through a secure system that I'll get into. Um, so you have this live stream of data going out where you know, every, you know, people, no matter where they are, if they're in Germany, if they're in Denmark, if they're on the other side of the oceans, um, they get this, the changes reflected instantly. Um, and um, at the same time, they can instantly access any old version through this, this protocol. And when I say instantly, yeah, I mean, you know, obviously it's just some, some milliseconds, but they wouldn't have to sit there and download a snapshot of anything. It would be like snappy. Um, and uh, that's basically where we spend all our research making this work. So, you know, real time, uh, but with versions and secure. <clears throat> then in recent years, uh, this is also kind of like a, the learnings I've had in like working with our protocols and also just working uh, with BitTorrent. Uh, we spend a lot of resources on what we'd like to call like making this home network ready. Uh, so what I mean by that is that <clears throat> we use this technique, I'm getting a little bit technical here, called so, uh, hole punching and hole punching is just a technique where you know you can actually run servers at home um, and share data uh, without having to know you know open ports on a firewall which you know no non-technical user would know how to do or, um, in, in almost every case so we use all kinds of techniques to get around that uh, which basically at the end of the translate to you can just run this stuff at home and you're peer-to-peer -peer, uh, immediately with no user interaction most of the time so it's very friendly in that way, and that's where we spend a lot of our time. And this is my favorite part, part about it. All this stuff, at the end of the day, what we're trying to do is just build you know, a folder in a file system, kind of like a Dropbox, um, where the only thing you interact with is a folder. The only thing you do is put folder files in that folder, get files out of that folder. But underneath that folder is basically a next generation internet protocol. You know, it's it's a it's a it's a trooper powered TCP HTTP protocol where you know we can build basically a web on top. And I'll get into that at the end uh, because we actually build browsers and stuff like that for this also. So it's it's, it's very cool and very spanning and, and just very exciting. But uh, oh yeah, and this is my favorite. But this is where. I, probably 80% of my questions are always coming. It's all written in JS, so like it's not C++ or anything, it's just the Node.js, um, so it's very hackable uh, from my point of view. <laughs> uh, and, 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 and straightforward and just tons of modules um, that all do things to help, to help with this. And you can actually pick it apart if you only want it, like the home network stack, you can get that out and very easily, um, very modular. So, that was the that was, that was like a little, my little intro teaser. Now I'm going to get to the very boring part. Uh, uh, so I'm going to explain to you how it works, and uh, then we'll get to the exciting part after. But you know, it's like a little carrot and stick. Um, so uh, I hope not too many of you follow me on Twitter because I tweeted a lot about this yesterday. Uh, but if you do, then you know I get to hear it from the horse's mouth. So that's always good, also. Um, so all of this is basically built on this concept. And if you've ever heard me at TNG, you heard me say this a billion times. It's 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 built on this concept called uh, append-only locks, and uh, it's, it's something. Sometimes I call it append-only locks. Sometimes I call it locks. Sometimes I call it feeds. Uh, but it's the same thing. Uh, so append-only locks. If you don't know, it's just it's it's an array that only grows. So you know you insert a piece of data, and you insert a piece of data, and then you can insert another piece of data. And then you can insert another piece of data, and you can keep doing like this. And it's, so it's just a list that goes upward. Um, <clears throat> and in Ethereum, at the end of the day, it's just logs. Um, and uh, they're great because they they work really well in distributed systems because you have this, they're very easy to share, they're very easy to digest, uh, to share parts of, all this kind of stuff. And I'll get into that. Um, so 
just you gotta start thinking about logs. That's that's all I'm saying. Uh, but these logs, you know, I can't just I can't just share logs uh, online. There needs to be some sort of security, or like you know, otherwise it's not very peer to peer. Uh, well, it's, it is super peer to peer, but it's not very secure. If if you know, if anybody can just send you random data, then versioning still doesn't, doesn't really mean anything. So obviously, security is a big part of this. So to secure these kind of logs, <coughs> what we do is uh, we use this technique called uh, Merkle trees. So um, Merkle trees is a verification technique uh, where uh, I don't know if you're familiar with that uh, the term a hash. And, uh, and again, I just want to say like feel free to jump in if anybody has anything to say uh, or not. That's also totally fine. Uh, but a hash is a it's basically a a way to fingerprint some data. So you can take a huge piece of data, you can run it through what's called a hash function. You get a tiny piece of data out that's like the fingerprint. And it's very easy to go from data to fingerprint, but you can go from fingerprint to data. Kind of like in the real world, it's hard if you just only see my fingerprint to know that it's me if you don't have a database. Um, and uh, that's basically what Merkle trees is. So, you know, if I took that up, uh, a log I had earlier and I kind of like flipped it on the side, like here and say, here, here is, here's the pieces of data. What I can do is, we can take that log and we, you know, every piece of data in that log, we could run it through a hash function and we get a hash of each of, of those blocks, like the fingerprints. And then we can continuously doing that and taking every other one and hashing those together. And now you can kind of see it starts building a tree, binary tree. And we can continue doing this until there's nothing more to do, like building this perfect tree. So at the top of it, uh, you know, as steep as it is, it's just hashes of hashes of hashes. Um, and th that's really smart because it basically takes a set of data and instead of you having to, to like individually trust every piece of that data, like if I wanted to share a, that set, uh, instead of having to send you every hash of that, uh, every fingerprint of that uh, block in that uh, list, I can just uh, here share the root because the root hashes everything. Uh, and why is that smart? It's smart because Let's say we wanted to verify an individual piece of data here. So for example, here, I wanted to, to, uh, to, to somehow, uh, the only thing I have is, is the root, uh, and I wanted to download the two here from anybody, you know, my worst enemy I would want to buy it from. That's always what we're saying in cryptography. I want to get something from my worst enemy. Uh, if they can't fool me, then it's pretty good. Um, so I want to get B2, what uh, uh, my enemy can do I should do is send me B2 and then these highlighted hashes here. So like uh, we call these ongles. Uh, so, you know, ongle because it's, you know, it's your, it's your, it's your parents uh, sibling and then your siblings, parents sibling. Um, <coughs> so if the, if the remote sends you that uh, and let's assume again, remember that we trust the, the purple one here or the pink one, what we can then do is, um, we want to verify that B2 is correct, but they only they just got this untrusted data. What we can do is we can hash B2. And then since we got that, that uncle from, from uh, the other person, we can hash the hash again to produce the, the, the parent hash. And then, you know, we can recursively do this again until we get to the root. So now we got a hash uh, of the root, uh, but since we already had a trusted hash to the root, we can just check, does these actually match? And if they match, um, then the data must match because you can't lie about a fingerprint. So there's no way they can fool us if we trust, trust the root. And this, this concept is very interesting because uh, Merkle trees like this uh, scale tremendously because it's like a, you know, it's a logarithmic data structure. And it's, it's a tree. So, you know, if you had, this is four pieces of data, but you have, if you had a billion pieces of data, it would still be pretty, you know, uh, small pieces of data you have to send. And uh, you can do all kinds of interesting optimizations in practice where, um, if when the remote person sends you um, uh, hashes, obviously if, if I here in that scenario here wanted to get B3 next, um, they wouldn't have to send me any other hashes because they would know that I now have all the hashes uh, because I verified B2. So uh, it's very small. And the overhead of this is, is, is surprisingly small. When you draw this out, it looks like, oh my God, there's so many hashes here in this tree. But if you just count them, uh, there's only ever gonna be twice as many hashes as pieces of data. You can see, you know, if you add them up to four plus two plus one, it's like seven and we have 
four pieces of data, so it's roughly double. It's always only roughly double. Um, so it's very it's very efficient, very few hashes, only two two hashes per piece of the data, which is it's very small, uh, but it gives you this sparse random access data structure. <clears throat> Just continuously checking on time here, so we do it, it's fine. Uh, yeah, so you know, if 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 the hedges match, then the data is untampered, and we and we can you know go on with our lives. So that's 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 quite nice. Uh, so that's a Merkle tree. So now you know what a Merkle tree is. If you didn't know before, now you know, and maybe you have a different understanding, and then you can yell at me later. <coughs> so what we do in, in Hyperdrive is we 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 take these append only logs because that's what we want to build on because they're easy to use in the distributed system. We want to make them secure. So we add on top of that, we add um, Merkle trees, and we produce this new data structure that we call uh, hypercores, which is also, uh, uh, from an academic point of view, what uh, some people call uh, a Merkle log. I don't know if uh, there's actually a term that describes all of it, but that's, that's what I've heard in the, in the, in the, in the industry. Um, so, um, <coughs> A Merkle log. Oh, sorry. I'm clicking all the buttons. Just gotta move my window here. Um, there we go. Sorry. A Merkle log is, uh, you know, a hypercore. It's it's just a Merkle tree where instead of you know us trusting the 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 root, we sign the root using public private key cryptography. And um, that way we can kind of mutate it. So it's not just static. Like I said, uh, it's, it, it's, uh, it's a live data structure. We want to get the real time that's working. Um, and since you sign with the private key, then if you have the corresponding public key, then anybody can verify that the signature is correct. Like normal public private key for cryptography. <clears throat> so, um, oh, I just noticed now here there's a Q and A section. I don't know, Garrett, if you wanna just jump in if there's any questions I wanna jump on, or if I should just do them myself. But uh, it's perfect timing. We just have a question, so um, I'm going to activate the microphone for uh, the person. So let's see if that works. Hi. David. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Yes, we can. Uh, what I was thinking, Angus, if P2 and P3 work together, isn't it in that case is possible uh, that they create together uh, a manipulated file of P2 and P3 compensates its part in a way that the root hash again works? Yeah, so that's, uh, I think, well, you're I'm just going to, I can actually, oh, no, I'm just going to Sorry, uh, I can show you here on this, this screen. I think what you're trying, well, you can't see my mouse, but if you look at P2 and P3 here, it's correct that if you don't uh, have any kind of framing or anything like that, then you could take parts of P2 and put it over at P3. And then uh, I think there are some attacks there you can do, but what you do in practice is you just frame them and then, then it's fine. And then it's, it's basically tamper proof, but um, that's a little bit hard to explain just uh, over the air, but it's, it, it is- okay. uh, Avoidable. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> a good question. Uh, we do. I do describe this in, in, in our implementation. It's called normally what's called. It's a pre-image attack, and it's one of those things that you just. Uh, it's very easy to avoid, but it's it's very catastrophic if you don't avoid it. Thank you. Okay. Question. Thank you. Uh, I can just quickly answer one here. I see there's there's a question from from Klaus that asks which hashing function we use. That's a really that's actually something I have uh, a lot of opinions about. We use uh, Blake 2B. Uh, so if you don't know Blake 2B, it's it's from it's a modern hash function. Uh, it's one that was in close competition to be um, um, the SHA-3. Uh, um, Blake 2B is very interesting because it's extremely fast. It's 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 if you look at software benchmarks, it's written in software because it's been written for modern computers. It's so fast that like it blows anything out of the water. So. We talked a lot, I do a lot of cryptography work. We talked a lot with people that still, you know, say uh, we use MD5s even though they're very, very broken because they're fast. And then we're like, well, if you look at something like Blake 2B, it's a modern function, it's unbroken, it's really secure, and it's, it blows MD5s out of the water. So just 
look up Lake Two Beam. Uh, it's good for anything you do. It's like it will. It's so fast it won't be anywhere near your bottleneck. It's just uh, really really good. Uh, yeah, I'll get back to it. <coughs> so you know here we have we have a root tree uh, from before, uh, and instead of us just trusting the root, let's say we trust the signature of the root instead. Um, so you know we, we you know we have a key pair and we sign the root. The cool thing about this is that now we can start to grow this this append only log. So if we append more data, uh, whenever it's not a pure factor of two, we get this like stilty character. Um, so we have like basically multiple roots, but, but we only ever have uh, log n roots because you know it's, it's powers of, of two. Um, and we sign both. That's fine. Like so, we hash them together and we sign that. So it's, it's still just simple. Uh, but we can keep growing it. So here, you know, when you, if you notice everything on the left is the same. And if I grow it again, I'm just slowly building up a new Merkle tree and, and you know, signing that synth synthetic root. And uh, I can keep doing that. Uh, and I can keep doing that. Um, so it's very easy to turn this into like a real time data structure is what I'm trying to, to get at. Um, and the really, really cool thing about this is that the only thing that mutates in this data structure, you know, the only thing we only, we don't just write once is the root signature. Everything else is just append only. And append, again, append, append only is extremely important in distributed systems because it, append only just means you can cache it forever. Um, so you only have to worry about the root signature. So our problem of mutation is only the root signature, which is much, much easier. It's just a little bit like a tiny piece, piece of information we need to share. Um, and uh, again, just going back to the Merkle trees, what the Merkle trees gives us is that this data structure, the history of this data structure, you know, all entries, it's, it's it's close to being tamper-proof. I mean, there's always some things you can do, but uh, basically, if if you have this view of the data and and uh, the the producer of this uh, uh, Merkle tree tries to pull one, a fast one on you and and modify all data, well, then they have to, you know you have to modify the, the Merkle tree if somebody new wants to get it because they have to trust the signature, and then the signature would have to change because it propagates up. Um, so. So it gets uh, it, it it gets very hard to attack. Uh, you have to do some very sophisticated ways of like isolating all peers on parts of the internet, and then maybe only sending them like that piece of data, pretending you're back in time. So it's just it's it's really secure by default, uh, with no UX overhead. So it's very very nice. So that's 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 the logs. Um, then um, I have a quick segue in here to like basically. So we have these data structures that are good at sharing, they're secure, they're real timey. To, to actually share them, we use something called DHTs, which stands for distributed hash tables, which you shouldn't worry about because that's just a name. It's nothing to do with tables anymore uh, in practice. Um, but basically, um, it's just a way for peers to find each other online. And again, this is I'm just putting this out there because this actually might be something you, you, you should look into if you don't know about it because it'll change your life. Um, so these T is just like have some key space. You have a peer, a peer have an ID, an ID is just some big number. What you do is you just put that peer somewhere on this key space corresponding to the ID. And then this peer just links to other peers with like exponential ex existence. So it has some view of the network where it says, I know where, you know, a peer that's a little bit further from me is, I know where the peer is more further, and I know where the peer is a lot further, and I know the peer is a lot further from me. And if a peer just maintains a little table like this, then you can have a network of hundreds of millions of peers and they can find each other really fast because what you do is you just need to find one peer and you, you, you have your ID and you ask that peer, which one is the, uh, of the peers you know is the closest peer um, to this one I'm looking for and they'll, they'll tell you that one and then you just ask that one. And if it's over here, the closest one is there and you just ask that one. <coughs> and you, you just keep doing this recursive stuff until you find what you're looking for. So, so you can take, you know, and, you know, IDs can just be public keys because they have, you know, just basically just a number. So it all ties in very nicely together in a, in a very modular way. Um, so what we do in practice is we, we use a, we use a hash of the public key uh, as, a, as an ID to find you. Uh, and we uh, call this a discovery key if you've ever seen it online. Um, because it's a key used to discover people with. So I was just uh, <laughs> quick. That's a DHT. Now you know. Uh, don't worry about it too much. 
And um, <clears throat> now we'll get to the, almost at the fun part now. Uh, basically, I just want to, you know, so now we, we have all the building blocks now, so I can actually tell you what a hyperdrive is. So hyperdrive is just something that uses hypercores, like these secure locks and DHTs to build a peer-to-peer -peer file system. <clears throat> so remember we had our Appendonia log. So basically what we do is instead of writing block in it, it's kind of boring to just write block. And we just write file system data into it. So we have a list of files. Um, it can be any files. And you know, we probably also should put in like the permissions and uh, the, 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 all the metadata we used to with files. Um, we just put that in the Appendonia log. And then, you know, we could just do it very trivially where we just have a long list of files, but then it would be very tricky to find anyone and we have to scan through it. Um, so what we do is we do this a little sophisticated thing that I just kind of teased here because I don't want to speak to you for weeks. Um, we do this thing where, you know, every entry uses the technique similar to what a DHT does to link back to previous entries in the, in the log. So basically TLDR, we, uh, you can find any item here. So if, if, if we have A, like the first, uh, sorry, newest item in the log, and we wanted to find B, um, basically what happens is that they have this embedded index where they link back using this distance function. Uh, so you can very quickly find any files file you want by just having a long array. Um, if you're interested in that, uh, it's what's called a hash try, and it's extremely powerful. It's kind of like a, a hashed version of a B tree. Uh, like, I'm just saying things, but uh, it's, it's, it's very, very cool data structure. It's actually, it's my, probably my favorite uh, new data structure because it's very easy to put into these logs. And it basically means that you can have an append only log of a billion file names, but you can find any file name in that log in like, you know, milliseconds. Um, so just really, really fast. And uh, we tested this by putting like all the article from Wikipedia into it just to see and, you know, we can be Wikipedia and performance still. So it's, it's, it's very, very good and very, very powerful. Um, <clears throat> but like just finding file names is, is pretty boring because if you find a file name, uh, you know, what you're probably interested in is, is, is the content of the file. That's kind of why we all look at file names. Um, so we got to put in some content also. So, you know, we could, we could just put the content in, in the file entry in the log, but that's, problematic because if you want to put in a gigabyte data, then that, that log will entry will be very, very big. And that's, that's bad. So what we do is uh, we actually have a, a design where we, we just use two logs. One log just has all the file names and that index and the other log just have all the contents for every file concatenated. So you just concatenate all the data as you write the files. And then what happens is that the, the, the metadata log, the file name log just links back to the, to the content one and says, you know what, my content is starting here and it's ending there and you can uh, random access anywhere to it if you just wanted to read parts of the data or like all the data, just the last part, whatever. Um, so very uh, simple, but actually extremely powerful. Also means that you can just get the file names if you just wanted that, if you're just interested in crunching those. <clears throat> Additionally, to help with collaboration, um, Metadata entries can also just point to other hyperdrives instead of pointing directly to content, which means that uh, we can basically build this thing called mounts. Um, so what I mean by mount is that you can have a folder that instead of being a folder that you control, it can point to another folder that somebody else controls. We can build these very um, um, elaborate collaboration models where um, and the uh, where you have these groups that collaborate and uh, you link to each other's folders and, uh, and they're all offline and peer to peer and nice. <coughs> uh, yeah, I'm just gonna uh, read a question here because it's a, it's a good time for a question. Ah, perfect. Okay. So uh, there's a question from Johannes. Have you ask you a question? Yeah. I will activate his audio. Johannes? Okay, we can. Yeah, now, you can maybe. hear me now. <laughs> I'm, Perfect. I'm yeah, hey. Hi. Hi, Matthias. Um, I would love to know um, how do you 
um, handle deleting files. So you map an mm -hmm. only data structure to a file system. How do I get rid of something? Because it sounds like it's yeah, that's a that's a that's a great question. I mean, obviously, uh, I would like to give you an hour-long answer, but it's 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 <laughs> it's um, it's much easier. This is a question also I get all the time because of the name append only. People are like, I'm going to run out of this. And it's, it's you know that's very valid. So the thing to remember is append only doesn't mean you have to get every data. Append only just means that you cannot reuse numbers. So if I put something in on entry five. I cannot overwrite entry five. If I wanted to overwrite entry five, I gotta append to entry six and then not link back to entry five. Here's the trick though. Nobody is forcing you to download entry five and you're gonna delete entry five after from your local cache. So append only just means you can reuse really numbers. The only thing we you know we use as a resource is numbers, like incrementing any numbers. So deletion just means that you, you push a, a deletion onto the log. Um, that then auto collect uh, collapses the log, so you know it's not gonna stay in there as a as a tombstone. We have a technique for that, um, but uh, and then new peers that come along uh, will just simply not download the deleted data, and you can just then GC that data when you want to. It's kind of like you know, yeah, actually GCing is a is a pretty good way of saying it. Kind of like in JavaScript, we never explicitly delete objects; they just disappear when nobody's pointing to them. It's the same idea, uh, except that our pointers are just append only. I don't know if that, that made any sense, but that's, that's, that's basically it. So it's actually not something you need to worry about too much. Um, uh, so, so yeah, the only thing that's like uh, unsolvable uh, in this is that, you know, a hash of that data is still in the, is still merkleized, it's still in the, in, the, in the entry. So, you know, you can get rid of the data, but you cannot get rid of the, the hashes. I mean, so the Merkle tree collapses also, right? So you, if you delete a true sibling, you only need to keep the parent to kind of keep building it. So it, um, that also auto collects, but you know there's there's a there's a trace of that data if you want to, if that's how I would put it, uh, for like you know also privacy concerns and stuff like that. Yeah. But you can there's other ways to get around that. I hope that was um, made somewhat sense. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Cool. Um, <clears throat> this is actually why it's, it's very nice to get these questions. I hadn't even thought about it. Like I said, there are so many angles to this. So, so um, yeah, so no, that's mounts. So, so um, the really cool thing at the end of the day, all this stuff is just exposed as simple file operations. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, you know, if you're used FS and Node, that's what hyperdrive is. It's just FS and Node, except for maybe the mount thing. That's a separate track of that. And uh, it's all somewhat understandable from a technical point of view, which is what I love about it. Um, I would love to give a demo now because that's always the fun part to see all my demos fail. I think when I demoed this in the past, it's always been some sort of crash. And crashes now, since we're remote, it's much more interesting because if you have to watch me reboot my computer, then uh, that might somebody to flap their wings for a little bit. But let's try it out. Um, so I'm gonna. It's gonna spice up the demo. We had it in the in the Node user group as well, but you were really fast and confident. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I think you just see my desert now, right? So I'm just gonna open a terminal and start in the terminal. Oh, there it is. So here's the terminal. <clears throat> so from a like command line users view, and we have a desktop app, like I said, that's coming out. So you don't have to worry about command line, but from a command line users point of view, hyperdrive is something you install. Uh, you can install it from NPM right today. Uh, our beta is uh, hyperdrive daemon delete to grab beta. Um, and then you get it down online. And then um, you get this command line tool that just has a bunch of commands. Uh, but the only interesting command it has is um, from you know getting started is this command called uh, hey start very easy. Once you run it, you can run status and uh, you can see that it's running, which is very good for me right now because then I know I can demo it. Um, <clears throat> so what does it do? Well it doesn't do anything except it exposes some APIs um, through SDKs and then it actually creates this folder called hyperdrive. So hyperdrive 
uh, this is all my content, so I'm not leaking too much. Now you can see that uh, this is our group drive at work where we you know, share all our stuff. Uh, it's called friends. Um, but this is all, this is the hyperdrive file system that I listed here uh, from my point of view. So this is all just P2P connected files. And um, I can do stuff like, <coughs> oh, it opens on, one second, it opens on my desktop. Uh, there you go. I can do stuff like open, you know, open this in a finder again. It's just a normal folder. Kind of that's what I meant by is kind of like Dropbox in those days. Um, um, but you can do what you want. Then using the the command line tool, um, you can create a new 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 drive to share. Um, did I make one called demo? No. Yeah. So I can make one here called uh, uh, demo. And uh, <clears throat> it spits me out this key. So this, this key here is that public key I was talking about uh, that's signing the, the changes. And hopefully now over here we'll have a, a demo folder. So that's all good, demo folder. Then, uh, then what I can do is I can go into that folder. Again, I just like to use the command line for this, but you know, you could you could open an application and, and do a text edit. And then um, I can write a file called uh, 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 world of text with uh, the content hello. So this file is actually now, you know, when I wrote that, what happens is it's actually appended to that uh, uh, virtual file system and indexed and, you know, put in that Merkle tree and sign and all this, you know, stuff I was talking about and, you know, with those two logs and it's building an index and it's, it's all happening really fast it's, it's, uh, because it's like a small iterative process. So that's very boring uh, because I can do that with a Mac already. But again, the interesting thing is that I can use this key now and then I can hopefully go to another computer. So this is another computer I have. Um, and I can start hyperdrive on that computer. And let's just run status to see that it's working. Uh, so it's working. Uh, it tells me here that my network is hole punchable, uh, which means that uh, uh, like no router configuration needed, which is like true in 99% of cases, basically. Um, so now what I can do is I can say, I can list my, my hyperdrive gears. I have some testing folder here, you can ignore that. But uh, then you know it's real. No, I'm not, not uh, just faking this data. <coughs> I can run mount because I want to mount this remote drive. And I can say, I want to run a hyperdrive, I want to call it. Demo. Oh, sorry, I forgot to give the key. I'm just gonna make it but you gotta get the key out there, otherwise it's just making any one. Then, let's see, we have 10 minutes left, so I'll try to make this a bit faster. See if this uh, loads, otherwise I may, may, might have messed it up. And we'll just try something else. <coughs> uh, one second. Ah, all right. I think I forgot to share it over here. Uh, there you go. Sorry, um, I have forgotten to 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 share it. So it was it was private. So. Um, <clears throat> you can see here that I have my uh, oh, sorry, my computer is being a bit weird. Have my file there, and uh, hopefully I can get it. Zoom is 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 taking a little bit of toll on my computer, but let's see if that works. Otherwise, I'll just do it the other way. So there, there you get hello. Uh, normally, <laughs> this is like millisecond. It's because. The recording is making my fan go like crazy right now. So you just you gotta uh, believe that little massage. Um, so let's try this. Um, you know, I can do stuff like put in a, a video. So what I can do is I can even drop in like, if I can get my computer to do it. Drop in like you know big files of video, and it you know it will index all that file in in the, in the hyperdrive, and uh, 
these files will be uh, hello home. guys i'm more that's like a little tutorial for Kerbal space program it's a really good game and uh, those files even though that was like you know 300 megabytes of data uh, propagate instantly to uh, every computer in the hyperdrive so all snappy fast um, uh, I kind of made this demo demo backwards now because you uh, I would only want to play this video if I can't play it on this computer because it doesn't have any UI. But you know, basically the point is that this data gets there fast, and you know I can get any slice of that data out immediately if I wanted to. Um, let's let's risk fade a little bit, and then I can hopefully convince you that this is uh, uh, PGP. Wow, this computer is not having it. Uh, info. And, um, demo two. Just want to get the key out again. Uh, I can take this key also and I can uh, go to another computer. <coughs> and I can do hyperdrive status. Is this running here? It is running. Hyperdrive mount. Uh, demo and then that key. So this computer is another computer running. Uh, I think it's it's in Germany. That's why I call it Hasselhoff. But uh, somewhere in Europe. Um, so you know, immediately all the data is there. Nothing has to download. Nothing has to propagate. It's all peer to peer. So you know, whenever I cat this file, now that file is here. If the network goes down, I can still cat it. If it never result, it will get the latest version. Uh, I could get slices of this, this, this file, etc. Um, the only final thing I just want to show you. So this is like you know, network peer-to-peer uh, -peer propagates out instantly. Um, <clears throat> the final thing I want to show you, and then I'll, if we have time for a question, I'll just take that. Uh, is that, like I said, this is also an internet protocol. So what you can do is. You can use a browser. So we have a browser called Beaker Browser, <coughs> which is a full fetch web browser. Um, that also opened up my other this time. That you can take and um, oh, I thought I had the key copied. Um, was it here? I had it. Okay. That you can take and you can you can give it these uh, these. Uh, these keys and it loads everything as a web browser. And um, so, you know, you can just, like I said, you can use it as a normal web browser. And then, obviously, what you can do is you can, uh, where's my computer? Is it this one? Um, instead of, you know, just sharing files, we can then start sharing HTML pages. I think this would work. Just try it. YOLO. So then, you know, all of a sudden I'm, I'm building these P2P web, websites, uh, but because it's all just at the end of the day, hypermedia, and anybody who visits this website helps share it, but you can also just download the websites on your file system. Uh, and we have all these kind of APIs so you can actually build interactive stuff there. Um, so yeah, um, really cool uh, stuff, I think. Um, I apologize for soon messing up my computer there a little bit. That's that's the cost of, of doing this things remote. Um, I'll just put on my final slide and then uh, we can just see how much time is left. We're getting pretty close. So yeah, one thing that's much better than having me show you that this works is that you can try it yourself. And on the first day, you can try it now, first of all, but uh, Documentation is not online and stuff like that, so you probably have a hard time. But uh, the code is out there. We're doing a public beta in six days. Uh, so basically, you can download the browser, you can download the daemon, you can run this, you can try it out at your home, you can make websites, um, you can send us feedback. Uh, there'll be a lot of tweets from us. Uh, very excited about that. It's 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 a big thing for us. So hopefully, you know. I hope to see a lot of Germans there. <laughs> That'd be awesome. And um, and, and thank you. Um, maybe we can take the, the final questions now, Gary, if you want to. Okay, sure. So we have had a question by Gordian um, a while back. So I'm going to give the mic to him. 
So you can ask it himself. Um, let's see if he reacts. No, not yet. But anyway, um, there has been another related question by David, uh, who has asked the question before. I will just give him the word. David? So, yeah. yes. Can you hear me, guys? Yeah. I yes, so. perfect. <laughs> Uh, what I was thinking is, is uh, uh, you uploaded now your video, but uh, and uh, when you made your LS as on your remote client, and you, you only had the name of the file, but the content is not yet there. But what if you execute now a copy command on the local machine? I assume the first step is uh, that the file needs to be downloaded, or can and and I make a copy command with a renaming and then directly just have the new name also available on the local machine so I could directly play the video with a new name also on my local machine without that the traffic needs to go to the uh, client and then back. Yeah, so that's, so basically, um, uh, if you have a content and you copy that content, the Merkleized version of that data, you know, when you return in the Merkle tree is gonna be uh, uh, identical because it's gonna produce the same hash structure. Uh, with a little massaging. And so we know that a file is the same, uh, a new file is the same as the old file. Uh, actually, right now, what we do it because um, we've been crunching so hard to get this out, we actually, we do download it again, but we do know it's the same. So we'll put out a, 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 a patch version at some point that's like just gonna link it out because that's, that's the next very exciting thing about this is that you don't have to reload. We don't have to download the same data again. You and also don't have to um, because fully merkleized data. If a file is similar to another file, uh, you also don't have to download the similar parts again. You know, a similar that, file. That, that was the ob obvious next question. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so you know, a sample, similar files is actually hard to think about, and that's a whole talk by itself. But a similar file, you know, the easiest way to think of a similar file would be that you add in a CSV file. And I copy that CSV file and I add a line, then you know mm -hmm. it's almost the same file. But from a hash point of view, it's definitely not the same file. The Merkleized structure, depending on how you chunk it, you know how you insert it, uh, it looks very the same. And then the, the system can do that. Um, so uh, that's my next very exciting thing to get out. You know, uh, uh, getting and basically turning the this, this switch and this deduplication. Thanks for that question. That's good. Okay, unfortunately, we're already out of time, but um, Let me just we add a couple of technical- because that's, that's also a question I get a lot, uh, if that's okay. I'll okay. take one minute. Sorry, sorry, Garrett, that's always never fun. To <laughs> those. Yeah, I'm okay with one or two more minutes, no problem. <laughs> uh, so there's a question here that's like, if I'm familiar with IPFIS, I am familiar with practice and we're very close with IPFIS. So, um, <clears throat> we, we, uh, we're all in that same space, but I said before, there's a lot of things. What IPFS does really good is the static snapshotting, um, uh, and what we and that's their main goal. And they have some some mutable pinning also, and we can talk about that for a long time. Um, what we try to do, and what we've been trying to do for all long, uh, all the time, is the real timeness of it. You know that changes propagate out instantly. That is like the the sparse. Um, you just get what you want immediately, uh, but it's a live version of a, like a collaborative system. So that's that's like that's that's the main. It's it's hard, sorry, to just like you know describe all the differences in like you know a minute because it's kind of like if you said what's the difference between UTP and TCP, or like HTTP, like all these transport protocols. It's like it's nuanced, but it's very distinct. So, so that's 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 basically like TLDR real time versus static, uh, and that's not the whole truth, but that's like the TLDR. That's that was my final thing, Garrett. Sorry about that. No, don't worry. I mean, we're all happy uh, that you take the time and ask um, and answer our questions. So, um, yes, agreed. Uh, it's a topic where we could definitely ask away for another couple of hours, but <laughs> unfortunately, the time is over now. There's the Slack space. So, Matthias. On Twitter, and uh, if you have any questions, you can just ask me or send me emails. So I'll, I'll answer them at some point. But you can also feel free to join the Slack space if you have a few more minutes and maybe people uh, will ask a little bit more there. Um, anyway, um, yeah, um, I will send it to you right afterwards. So uh, thank you very much on behalf of uh, the whole audience. Uh, 
more than 100 people joined us and there are still uh, 98 left. I think we can have a, a short question um, that was asked by Marcus a while back through a different channel. Are you using TypeScript or anything? What's your take on that? Or uh, yeah, uh, I don't. I'm a I'm a JavaScript purist, uh, so I don't like to compile things when I don't have to. But uh, I know that Paul, who I work with with this, uh, used uh, type comments in his thing for gigs, so because that gives him the same benefits without the the full compilation. Ah, I guess that goes with the motto of YOLO in the demo. <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't do that one. But like, uh, but very yeah. nice. But like, uh, I mean, I've been here. I've been in that space for eight years, and I, I seen, I seen the TypeScript come and go. So I'm, I'm a very conservative guy with that kind of stuff. So don't listen to me. <laughs> okay, okay. I'm going to. Uh, so uh, there's no way to uh, get uh, applause from the audience directly, but we can show the poll, which I'm doing now. So um, is it good? people is it can good? now rate the <laughs> presentation, and our speaker is going to see the result, a live result. So um, this is one way to show our appreciation. And um, it's quite clear that uh, people like the talk a lot. If you have any feedback on the, the visual style and like the, the, the clearness of the diagrams, because we're going to take these diagrams and put them on a documentation page, uh, also feel free to give me feedback somehow, um, because I want to make this as clear as possible. OK, so um, obviously, people like to talk a lot. So thank you very much, Matthias, once more. Yeah. Um, I will send you the link to the Slack channel and uh, maybe you can stick around a few more minutes and maybe some people have more questions there. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. And to all of the others, uh, see you later in the other talks.